Greetings, this is Greg. I want to talk about the Focal Wolf FW-190A8 as it's used in Digital Combat Simulator, and I want to talk about the real-world aspects of the airplane as well. We're coming in here on a Spitfire Mark 9, and I'm going to fire everything we've got here, and I did a lot of damage to his left wing, and I see some smoke. I'm pretty darn sure we badly damaged the heat exchanger for his intercooling system, so that's good for us, but a damaged Spitfire is still an extremely dangerous opponent in a close-in dogfight. Even if their wing is Swiss cheese, they still got a lot of wing. So we're going to make a big turn here. Basically as big as we can so that we can keep the opponent in sight. It will be a struggle to keep him in sight, but that means we're making the circle about the size we want. The enemy plane will have a harder time keeping us in sight because he's battling a damaged airplane while trying to keep his eyes on us. As I come back in here, I've got plenty of speed, but I'm going to have to slow down to avoid overshooting. That's kind of bad planning on my part, but we're just going to have to accept it. And I'm going to try and line up the shot here, but just as I start to get lined up, the Spitfire tries a hard brake turn, which I can't really follow. I do have to stay with him as best I can, otherwise he could just turn right and be on my tail. So I've got to stay with him for a little bit, and as we do that, we see that his turn rate starts to decrease and he's really shallowing the turn out. Could be that the pilot's blacking out from that sudden brake turn, could be the plane is damaged, uh, could be he just lost sight of us, could be a lot of things. In any case, we're going to fire when he fills the ring here for maximum effect and that's one less Spitfire we're going to have to worry about. At this point, what we do have to worry about is enemy aircraft that uh, he talked to on the radio or maybe saw the smoke from a distance. In any case, uh, bad guys could be coming to get us. So we're going to lower the nose, get low to the ground where we're harder to see, keep checking 6, set power to 1.2 ATA, that's our maximum continuous power, and we're going to leave the area. Now onto a multiplayer server. I'm going to fly a mission to knock out the train station at Cherbourg. Intelligence has reported that there is a high-ranking Allied delegation there. Our mission is to take off from our base at Goulet, sneak our way deep into Allied territory, and bomb the train station. Then attack targets of opportunity on the return trip, hopefully make it back to base. Here's the route I plan to fly. After takeoff from Goulet, I'll turn left near position 1, that's right after takeoff. Then I'll fly towards position 2. The magnetic course for this leg of the trip is 289 degrees. It's about 103 kilometers in distance and in the no wind conditions I'm anticipating will only take about 14 minutes. I want to stay pretty low so I'll be using a combination of dead reckoning and pilotage to find my way as explained in an earlier video. I'll only be about 20 miles south of St. Lo which is a busy area so I'm going to want to stay very near the ground so I'm difficult to pick up on radar or visually. As I approach Bray Hall, I'll watch for Allied aircraft that could be attacking the German headquarters there. Once I'm offshore a bit, I'll turn north to a magnetic heading of about 355 on my way to point 3. I can use the friendly anti-aircraft fire from Bray Hall or the German ships I'm expecting to encounter offshore to provide cover if I find myself in trouble and need the help. But the priority here is to stay hidden so I can take out my primary target, which of course is the train station at Cherbourg. On the way north, I'll keep an eye on the shoreline landmarks until I reach Le Pew, at which point I'll turn towards Cherbourg. Once there, I'll bomb the train station, hopefully, and start heading home. On the return trip, I'll attack the Allied headquarters at Briquebec. This area is just too well defended for a serious attack by a single airplane. So I'll make one strafing pass and I'll just keep going. If my plane is still okay, I'll start a circling climb as B-17s often come through here at high altitudes and I'd like to shoot one down. It's also possible I'll find an Allied fighter unaware or possibly damaged and returning to their base at Lassay. I'm not looking for a fair fight here, I'm looking for something easy. Then back to Bray Hall. This time I'll offer assistance if the headquarters there is under attack or I again could get uh, friendly on the aircraft fire if uh, I need that to cover me. From Bray Hall it's back to base. Now this mission is right at the range limit for an FW-190A8 when carrying a 500 kilogram bomb, which is what I'll have and when flying at the higher speeds needed in enemy territory. So if I want to make it back, 
I am going to have to keep an eye on that fuel gauge and keep fuel consumption in mind. Here we are on the runway. It's a grass strip. My plane has full internal fuel and the biggest bomb load it can carry. Taking off in the A8 isn't too difficult, although I haven't done it in a while. I've frozen the video so we can talk about what's next. The trick to taking off in the A8, or the Dora 9 for that matter, is to keep the stick all the way back and slightly to the right until about 150 kilometers per hour indicated. Then center the stick in the fore-aft direction, but keep that slight pressure to the right. The entire time during the takeoff roll, you'll have to work the rudders to keep the plane going straight, especially on grass fields. However, the rudders will generally be biased to the right because P-factor will be pulling you to the left the entire time the tail is down. A good rule of thumb is to go to full right rudder at the start and then back off as needed. Obviously, I'm talking about an FW-190 here and with the tailwheel locked. The tail will start to rise slowly once the stick is centered at 150 kilometers per hour. If it doesn't, just help it a little bit. It's important that it only rise slowly and only a little. Otherwise, the gyroscopic forces will pull the nose to the left with more force than your rudder can counter, at least down at this speed. On the other hand, if you increase it uh, slowly enough, sometimes you'll find that the plane will go to the right as you raise the tail because P-factor's left turning tendency will be decreasing as the tail comes up. But you already have that right rudder in there. If all this seems confusing, it is a little bit, but the key is to avoid the problems of the asymmetrical forces from the gyroscopic effect. Avoid those problems in the first place. Keep the stick all the way back until 150 kilometers per hour. Then center it. The tail will rise a little bit and the plane will just fly off the ground. Be ready for the torque roll to the left, which is why we pre-position the stick to the right. Here we go. Okay, we're going to go to full power because of the relatively short and soft airfield and we're heavily loaded. Full right rudder there, but as we speed up, I'll be using less and less right rudder because the rudder becomes more effective. At 150 kilometers per hour, I'll put the stick to neutral. Made a couple mistakes there. No big deal though. The key here is don't get the nose moving up or down too much or too fast or the gyroscopic forces will just give you hell. So we're off the ground. I've got the gear coming up and I'm going to retract the flaps about now right when we're coming through 250 kilometers per hour. You may want to wait a little bit longer if you're at these really heavy weights but that's just the way I do it. I want to get the plane cleaned up. Now we're going to start getting ourselves away from the airport traffic area with this left turn that's also turning us towards our intended course of 289. There's a friendly 109. That bodes well. I hope that uh, if there are enemies in the area, we'll have some help, but I really don't think there are. I've cut out some of the footage in the interest of brevity. Also, I cut out the in-game audio track because I was on comms, there was a lot of chatter. So in the interest of player privacy and YouTube rules, I just eliminated the in-game audio. My takeoff wasn't the best after the stick came forward. There was a moment when I gave it too much right rudder, although too much is better than not enough. You can always correct to the left on the takeoff run as most of the asymmetric propeller forces will help you do that. Also, I didn't have the stick to the right, so that worked against me. In my defense, I hadn't flown the Anton in a couple of weeks, and I'm not sure I've ever flown it off a short, soft field fully loaded. The takeaway is that if you stick with the procedures I described, you'll be fine, even in a worst case situation. We're on the Wolfpack server, which I really like. At the moment, there are not too many players here, but more are joining in all the time as we fly our mission. This server has built-in missions, but this one is just something that I made up. To keep it sporting, I did tell the other players on comms exactly where I was going and what I was going to do. Plus, we have AI aircraft mixed in. I want to stay low and fly more or less that 289 degree course towards Brayhall. I can get away with a power setting of 1.32 ATA for 30 minutes at a time. Of course, I have to keep my temperatures in check, which is more of an issue when carrying an external load because the extra drag lowers speed, thus cooling airflow for a given cowl flap position. So when you're carrying bombs, keep a little more, a little better eye on temperature than maybe you normally would. Let's get a few things out of the way here. I'm not sponsored by anyone involved in DCS. In fact, I've never even communicated with any vendor selling this stuff. 
I'll be talking about with the exception of maybe a YouTube comment here or there. I'll be intermixing my discussion about the mission we're flying with DCS and real-world FW-190A8 or Anton info. I want to say that if you looked at DCS in the past and then moved to another simulator, you may want to look at it again. DCS is improving all the time and it's just amazing. The 190A8 module is fantastic. It's as close to owning a real A8 as almost any of us can get. Even without flying it, just sitting in the cockpit and exploring all the switches and gauges is pretty exciting. Furthermore, there is a great single player campaign for it named Harido. It's by Reflected Simulations. I don't know if Reflected is a one-man show or a team of people, but the amount of effort he or they put into the campaign really shows through with the quality. It's so good that I have to say, get the campaign when you get the A8. You're going to want it. Now, the campaign assumes you already know how to do everything the A8 can do, including ground attack, navigation, use of drop tanks, and so on. So don't start the campaign until you're ready to take command of an FW-190 squadron. But once you do start it, you'll see that it was money well spent. I don't want to give anything away, but there are some really cool surprises in it. And it has a, it has a great ending. In fact, while I was playing it, I was really enjoying it. But I was wondering, how are they going to end this? Because if you're flying for the Luftwaffe, it's most likely going to end on a real downer. But they did a great job with it, and I don't want to give anything away. The mission I'm flying today, plus the stuff that'll be towards the end of this video, will show you pretty much everything you need to be able to do in order to fly Reflected's campaign, with the exceptions of drop tank usage and engine startup and giving commands to uh, other people in your squadron. In regards to the A8 module itself, I'm going to lead here with the negatives, but they're small negatives. Here goes. The real FW-190A8 had an interesting feature to clean the windshield in flight. Unless I'm just an idiot and can't find it, I don't think it's present in the DC-8, Anton, and I was kind of looking forward to trying it. There are some tubes with little holes in them on either side of the armored glass windscreen. In the real airplane, these can be pressurized with aviation fuel from the plane's fuel system and it sprays fuel to clean oil or whatever else off of the armored windscreen and the windows on either side of it. This is a minor complaint and I certainly haven't seen it modeled in any other sim, but it would be really cool to have. My other complaint is something that's a bigger deal to me, but not really an error. It's not something that's wrong with the plane in simulation. I'm talking about the lack of the ability to run manifold pressure values above 1.42. Super quick FW-190 Anton history, partial history anyway. The earlier A5 model could run 1.42 ATA, but there were sub-variants of that plane that could bump power up to 1.58 when on the first supercharger speed and 1.65 ATA on the second. They did this in the A5 variants via an interesting mechanism, and I'll talk about that another time. For the A8, they did largely the same thing, enable more manifold pressure, but simply did it by allowing the throttle to open more and having the main injector spray in more fuel. So most but not all A8s could run 1.58 or 1.65 ATA depending on which supercharger speed they were using. Above 1900 meters thereabouts, they would be on the second speed. Furthermore, they could do this for 10 minutes at a time, so that's a lot of power for a long time period. However, historically, this gets a bit murky. When the A8 came out, it was not so equipped. It was limited to 1.42 ATA, and it was that way until around June of 1944. We know the A8s had the ability from then on to use the higher manifold pressure numbers because there are numerous test results for them. There's documentation from the Luftwaffe saying, look, this is what we're doing. And the higher manifold pressure numbers are specifically described in the pilot's uh, flight manual with an effective date of July of 1944. Now, considering the plane set in DC-8 that the Anton is going up against, 
The time period we should be looking at is late 1944 at the earliest. That's when the 190K4s and the FW190 Dora 9s were flying around. But we have a 190 Anton with engine limitations that may have been only used during the first half of 1944. The P-47s and P-51s in DCS are late war variants as well. So I really think the Anton should be able to run the extra power. Without it, the A-8 just isn't competitive in air-to-air, -air, at least not with the U.S. fighters. In fact, it's pretty far from competitive in multiplayer air-to-air. -air. Even with the extra power, it's a little behind with the plane set we have right now. But with the extra power, it would at least be closer. I have no idea why the Anton is limited this way in DCS, but I do have some thoughts on this. First of all, it's not historically incorrect. They were built and flown this way, and if there's a plan to include earlier versions of 109s, P-47s, and P-51s, as well as bombers the Antons could hunt like B-26s and B-24s, maybe a few British bombers, then the Anton would be much more usable in multiplayer just the way it is, and in a historically accurate context. Right now, nearly every time you see an allied plane and you're in an Anton on multiplayer, you should probably run and hide because of the DCS plane set, not because the Anton is um, misrepresented. It's because the setting, the way they have it set it up is just from a different time period. Now, I can think of a couple other reasons the 1.42 limitation might make sense. In the actual manual for the airplane, it says that planes equipped with the higher limits have a yellow circle about two inches in diameter near the rear left side of the fuselage armament cover. I haven't found that circle clearly visible in any wartime picture of an A-8. Now that's hardly conclusive. Pictures of A-8s are not that common. The Germans were running out of food when these planes were in service. They couldn't just run down to Photomat and get film. Everything was hard to come by, especially non-essentials. Maybe they just didn't bother painting those yellow circles. It wouldn't be the first time a sentence in a manual was ignored. Or maybe that order was rescinded in some later document I haven't seen. This mod did not require different fuel, so an external indication wasn't that important anyway. The mod to allow the extra power involved things done by mechanics, special spark plugs, things like that. One more thing um, that may have occurred to the developers is balance. The P-47s and P-51s are not running their maximum manifold pressure limits either. In DCS, the P-47Ds um, are running 64 inches, but they were running 70 inches officially by mid-1944, and 72 inches is well documented but was unofficial. Again, in the sim, the P-47s are limited to 64 inches, which is the number in the pilot manual. I don't fly the P-51 in DCS, but I'm pretty sure it's limited to 67 inches, not 75, which they could run by mid-44. However, and this is a big however, in DCS, in multiplayer, many sim pilots, myself included, remove the wing pylons of U.S. fighters, which brings performance up so it's about equal to the levels with those higher manifold pressure limits. Yet in wartime, pictures from the European theater all show 47s and 51s with the wing racks. I've seen a lot of the pictures and I haven't seen any of them without them. So the performance, even at those slightly lower manifold pressures, is on par with reality for the two U.S. fighters. However, the Anton is just left way behind here. Those are literally my only complaints with this module in DCS. It's otherwise just awesome and I love it, both in single player and multiplayer. Just keep in mind, in multiplayer you should probably stick with anti-bomber and ground attack stuff, at least if you're lone wolfing. If you're flying with uh, your buddies in a squadron, that's another case and the Anton can be effective air to air. In terms of the bigger picture, meaning all of the World War II DCS stuff, the single biggest complaint I hear about DCS as compared with competing flight sims is the relatively small number of aircraft available. So I want to address that. Yes, there are fewer aircraft, and for the most part, when you buy one, you get one, plus sometimes a sub-variant or two. For example, the P-47 module gets you three versions of the plane, all late war variants. This is in contrast to other sims 
in which the same amount of money gets you a plane set with five or so different airplanes and more sub variants. The big difference in favor of DCS here is that you get the whole airplane. I don't know of any other simulation of World War II airplanes in which everything works. In the case of the Anton here, every switch in the cockpit works. That doesn't mean I actively manipulate them all. I set the ones I need all the time to my HOTAS, and then I use the mouse for things I generally only press once or twice per flight. In this plane, the fuel system works correctly, so does the electrical system. Just everything, and to me that's worth something. The planes are so detailed that it's actually hard to stay proficient in more than two or three at a time. In fact, lately I've been flying the P-47 and I'm already feeling a bit rusty in the Anton. I simply don't miss having a couple dozen airplanes as I usually only fly a few anyway, and DCS, while I do plan to get all of the World War II airplanes, I'll mainly fly only a few. DCS also has very accurate flight models. That's not to say they're perfect, I can find things I don't agree with, but far fewer of those things than with competing sims. I honestly feel that if you can fly a plane like a P-51 in DCS, you would probably be able to take off and land the real thing. It's, it's that good. Back to our mission for a moment. We made it to the shoreline without encountering any enemy aircraft. That was probably the leg with the most danger of that. It's unlikely we will be intercepted over the water because the Allied airplanes here will either be bombers at very high altitudes or any of them that are down low will probably be focused on the German ships. If we are spotted, we can use those ships for anti-aircraft cover. We're headed towards Le Pew. My pronunciation of all these French towns is based entirely on my understanding of how to pronounce Chevrolet, so I'm probably not even close, but I'm not too worried about it. I do want to discuss the DCS simulation a little bit more. I will certainly acknowledge that DCS dropped the ball in the World War II arena in the past, but the problems they had are now fixed. It's now the best thing going in this area. I would like to see them expand the plane set by adding older versions of the existing planes to get a wider range of realistic scenarios we can fly. We have the 109 K4, that's great. But in reality, those were very rare. Even Eric Hartman didn't fly one in combat, at least not that I know of. Adding in late G6s and G14s, along with the 190A6, would allow the German airplanes to cover a much wider time period. On the American side, same sort of thing. I'd like to see older P-47 and P-51 models to cover early 1944. Of course, I'd like to see a few totally new airplanes, P-38, A-26, a flyable Ju-88, stuff like that. But I understand the effort that would involve and the economic realities at work here. I just think giving us older versions of the planes already in the sim would go a really long way towards improving the overall experience. It wouldn't be terribly difficult. Back to our mission. We're coming up on the town of Le Pew. The curvature of the coastline here is very distinctive. It's an excellent landmark, and so I know this is where Le Pew is, and it's where I need to make my turn towards Cherbourg. We're going to check the map here to get the the course for the next leg. We're going to fly Cherbourg to the Allied headquarters, where we're going to do our strafing run. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want that uh, required magnetic course to be fresh in my mind. I should have wrote it down on a sticky note or something before I took off, but I want it to be fresh in my mind after I drop that bomb because the, the bomb, is whether it hits or misses, is probably going to make a lot of smoke and fire, and my target is within very easy visual distance of an Allied base, and it's going to attract the wrong kind of attention. So when we drop that bomb, we don't want to spend time meandering around figuring out where we want to go. We just want to get low and fast and head right towards our target. You can see some smoke in the distance. Anytime you see smoke um, in DCS, certainly on the Wolfpack Normandy server, means something has happened there, at least black smoke. And in this case, it probably means that some airplanes have crashed there, and hopefully that battle's over because I don't want anybody interfering with my bombing run, but I don't know yet. Also, it could mean that there are ground targets there that were hit, but uh, yeah, that's possible. I really don't know why that smoke is up there, but it means we need to be cautious. The 190 Anton is a fairly easy airplane to fly. It's Right now I'm making sure everything's armed. It's a fairly easy airplane to fly. 
I think it might be the best first Warbird in DCS to get. Uh, takeoff and landings are reasonably easy. The cockpit layout is great. The systems are fairly easy. Uh, overall, it's just an easy airplane to fly. Just don't be expecting to do really well with it air to air, at least not one versus one. But it's still great for hunting down bombers. It's still great for air to ground. And it's a great airplane to just fly around. One thing to keep in mind with the Anton if you start with a cold dark airplane and then use the auto start function in DCS, oh, we'll come back to that. Right now I'm uh, pulling up the player list to see if there are any pilots, human pilots, flying off of that air base that's near our target, and there, there are. Anyhow, if you take a cold dark airplane and you use the auto start, then your bomb dropping mechanism won't be bombed. You'll push the button and nothing will happen. Uh, you have to open up the circuit breaker panel forward right and make sure the forward most breaker is in otherwise the bomb won't drop now you could use the emergency release and get rid of the bomb that way but it won't detonate so in the anton you well any other airplane in dcs you kind of have to learn what the switches do but that's a good example of something that you set up before takeoff and you don't touch it again for the rest of the flight the the plane is great in that respect it's easy to set up prior to takeoff and then once it's in the air there's really not all that much you have to touch all right we're turning in to try and hit our railway station and even though i looked at the map beforehand and i really studied it right now i'm a little unsure of where it is i know i'm flying right towards it but i didn't see it it's on the right hand side of the screen in the corner window right now well now it just went off the screen but uh, here we'll turn around and you'll see it again. It's at the end of the two rail tracks, so you see it there. And what we're going to do is come back in and bomb it. I'm going to do what's typically called a procedure turn, at least in civilian aviation, more thought of as an instrument flight, flight rules thing, but it's going to work well here. We turn about 45 degrees to the right, then 180 to the left, and then about 45 to the left, and that'll put us back on the same track over the ground that we were on when we nearly overflew the building so um it's a good way to reverse course not just reverse direction but reverse course and be on the same ground track the military guys do this same thing uh, they call it a procedure turn no they don't call it a procedure turn. they call it a 8260 or a 9270 i think i don't know might want to check with like a f-15 pilot or something about that but civilian world that maneuver was called a procedure turn so now we're just about lined up on the building. I'm maneuvering here because I want to come in on it lengthwise because bombing with this type of equipment is much more accurate in azimuth than it is in range. So I know that if I line up on it lengthwise, I'm going to hit it even if I mess up a little bit because the range just doesn't have to be that accurate to get a direct hit. So there we go, direct hit. Uh, it had a five second delay, which is it was a big bomb, 500 kilograms. That's, uh, you know, 1,100 pounds or so. So that delay enabled us to get away from the explosion unscathed. And now we're going to stay low, 1.32 ATA, which again is good for 30 minutes. That 1.42 is only good for three minutes, which is another big limiting factor. I can't stress enough. I wish I could go to 1.58 because that's actually good for 10 minutes. In any case, 1.32, that's all I want to do. Temperatures look good. Um we're low enough so that I don't think we're going to be spotted. I'm looking around a little bit, but I'm just not worried. And we're going to be at that Allied headquarters pretty quickly. I'll be careful to hold my heading more correctly for this leg because on this leg, we do have to overfly something specific. It's not like the first leg where we we're going to Bray Hall where we're really just wanting to hit the shoreline in that general area. So I'll be looking out at the landmarks. And again, I looked at the map beforehand and I recognize some of the stuff that I see, the pattern of the forest that's off to our right right now specifically. So I know that we're on course and soon we should be able to see the target. We're just going to make one strafing run, but that should be enough to knock something out. Remember, we've got twin 13 millimeter machine guns up there. They're very equivalent to US 50 cals. They, they pack a pretty heavy punch. Better than that, we have four internally mounted in the wing 20 millimeter cannons, and they're MG 151s. That's a really good cannon. There were earlier versions of Anton's A5s, for example, that could carry four cannons in the wings, but the outboard cannons were MGFFs, which 
were not as heavy duty. They didn't pack quite the punch of the MG-151. So we have a lot of forward firepower, at least as good as any other World War II fighter. Now, it turns out we are on course because I see the target area ahead. I zoomed in there and I see two vehicles. Um, I think they're trucks. Yeah, in fact, they are. I'm going to try and make a strafing run. They're not lined up perfectly, but I'm throwing so much explosive ammo out there. I think we'll be able to take both of these trucks out in one pass. They're starting to shoot at me, the defensive fire, that is. They're just waking up. And, okay, I've got both of those trucks on fire. Once they're on fire, they're going to go out. Nobody's going to put those fires out in time. So eventually those will be two destroyed trucks. Unfortunately, they hit our right wing tip. Uh, it doesn't seem like anybody's following us, but there's no question that the Allied headquarters will call for help. So somebody is now coming this way. That may not have been true with the railway station. Uh, that was more an issue of visual smoke. We definitely have some left wing tip damage as well. So we took some superficial damage, but temperatures look good. The engine's running perfectly. I'm absolutely not concerned right now. I'm a little concerned about fuel quantity, but uh, I think we're going to make it back even with an air-to-air -air engagement, which at this point I'd, I'm hoping to have. So now I'm going to start a slow climb and look for enemy aircraft. Ideally, I'd like to catch a formation of B-17s. They come through here around 6,000 meters, so pretty high up, but we're pretty light. We can get there now. Unfortunately, climbing through the supercharger gap takes a lot of time. There's a range where the low speed, low altitude gear for the supercharger doesn't spin the supercharger fast enough, but if you engage the high speed, it spins too fast and has to be throttled too much. Either way, power suffers. Now, the supercharger will automatically change speeds in this airplane, but the result is that you have a bad, uh, let's call it a supercharger gap, a inability to get anywhere near full power from about 1500 meters to about 2300 meters and it's just unpleasant to be there in this airplane you don't want to be there but once we get through that range we'll be able to get uh, pretty decent power again i'll run 1.32 in the climb uh looks like we're, we're there now so i'll be uh, looking for b-17s uh, you can usually spot them by the contrails and if you're attacking B-17s, well, there's just no great way to do it. You can't attack B-17s with absolute impunity in the Anton, unless you're using standoff rocket attacks and those things never hit. So in terms of attacking B-17s with your guns, you're, you're at some risk. One of the best ways to do it is to make it a head-on attack. That enables you to take out the B-17 in a single pass if you can line everything up. It's tough. The closure rates are really high. But it's also tough for the B-17's gunners, and that's a situation that gives you the greatest advantage. Another way to attack B-17's that's pretty effective and relatively safe is from directly above. Because of the way the fields of fire work on that upper turret, if you pass from the forward half of his field of fire to the rear, in other words, once you pass behind the turret, he's got to spin around 180 degrees to keep you in his sights, and he usually won't have time to do that before you've passed through and you're below the airplane. So a, a vertical or near vertical dive, again, tricky to do because the closure speeds are super high, but those are pretty effective at taking out B-17s and uh, with relatively low risk to yourself although not as good as the head-on pass. I see a speck out in the distance here, and we're going to investigate that. It's, it's not a B-17 because they travel in formations. I can't tell what it is yet. Could be friend or foe. We're going to keep heading that direction and try and figure this out. Okay, it's definitely a single-engine fighter, sees us, and is coming our way. Of course, he may not know yet if we're friend or foe either. We are pretty near uh, Allied base, and I haven't seen any anti-aircraft fire, so I assume that's an enemy aircraft. I'm going to line up to take a few shots here because I don't want him to put his machine guns on me. It's a P-47, so he's got eight of them, pretty dangerous. Fortunately, we didn't have a head-on pass here. On one hand, we're in a pretty bad situation here. The 47 can outrun us, it can outmaneuver us. 
We certainly can't outclimb him, but he's really wasted a lot of his energy here by diving through our altitude and then having this big turnaround. Not that this matters too much. He's going to catch up to us anyway, but I'd rather start the fight with equal energy than the situation he had a moment ago. Of course, he's behind me. What I'm trying to do here is drag this fight down to the deck because I want to be outside of my supercharger gap area. It would just be death to fight him in that altitude range. And I want to uh, run my engine at 1.2 or 1.32, a power setting that I can run for a long time. And I'm hoping that he's running a really high level power setting so that he's closer to burning up his engine than I am. I'm making these S turns just to uh, avoid getting hit from long range. He might have a gyro gun sight and if you make a course correction or a change in your rate of turn every couple of seconds, the gyro won't really be able to uh, do him any good. And like I say, I don't want to get hit by 50 cals even from long range. So keep these S turns going. And ultimately, we're at a big disadvantage in a 1v1 here, but the 190A8 has one thing it can do. It's kind of a one-trick pony. It's pretty good in horizontal scissors. So I need to get him in close enough to force an overshoot, which will either result in us going into scissors, hopefully, or I can use scissors to get him into an overshoot. But it's going to be tricky. Um, p 47s a... a formidable opponent for the Anton. He's going to take some shots here, but I tighten the turn and he misses. He's still behind me, but he is closing. More shots, but he misses. And now we're getting the scissors going, which is great. I'm getting the throttle back, the flaps down. Looks like he throttled back too, though. I passed in front of him, but not within his field of fire. And this next turn in the scissors, I would have had him, so he broke off the scissors and went straight or maybe even turned right a little bit. Now he's coming back to the left. So now he's out in front. That's great. He's pretty far out in front. He should have just kept going. I'm not quite sure why he's staying in this left turn. And he's contrailing, which means he's pulling pretty hard. This is good for me. The slower the fight is... Um, the better it is for me in terms of an energy fight because my plane can out accelerate his and neither one of us has altitude to train to trade for airspeed anyway so now i've got my flaps set at the takeoff position and i can use that 1.42 ata which is all i've got wish i had more line up this shot i think i hit him there with machine gun fire probably just on the wingtip that wasn't a great shot but uh, any hits are, at this point are hedging things in my favor. It's also good that I'm so light. You know, obviously I've lost that bomb, but I've been flying for a long time. I'm maybe lower on fuel than he is. Hope so. Now this is going to turn into a, uh, a rate of turn contest. And he probably should win that, but he doesn't seem to be. I think that he has his flaps up. I have my flaps in the takeoff position. He may not be able to be using his full 64 inches of manifold pressure either. He could have heated his engine up earlier. We don't really know. In any case, he's wing wobbling, which means he's on the limits of his performance. We're not. So we're just going to bide our time here until we've got a shot and then open up. We definitely got some hits there. They weren't great hits. Uh, he's maneuvering well enough that I can't really get a really nice tracking shot where I pour a bunch of ammo into them. They've all been little pot shots, but they are taking their toll. And we'll get another one here. Hopefully, nope, I didn't, didn't really get it lined up too well there. He's really in trouble here. I'm, I'm in the control zone. I'm not going to overshoot. And he doesn't have enough speed down here or acceleration down at these speeds to get out of my gun range. So He's really in a world of hurt. We've got some more hits on him here now. He's smoking a bit more. So we should be able to line up and hopefully, hopefully finish him off in one more shot. But he is pretty good at staying out of my sights. And when he is in my sights, he he jinks out right away. So pretty competent opponent. Certainly not one of the best ones I've fought against. Uh, there are people on this server that, that, you know, beat me four out of five times, no problem. So... Anyhow, there, he's pretty well shot up. 
and oh, I started to get an accelerated stall and he went into horizontal scissors. So I don't want to scissor with him right now because it's possible he could still win that. I'm not sure how shot up he is. So I'm going to stay out of his gun line of sight here, staying underneath his line of sight, and we're just going to keep this turn in because I'm right at the optimal speed, slightly above maybe for my best sustained turn rate, and I know already that he can't keep up with me because probably because he's shot up. Like I say, a P perfect P47 would be able to. We'll come back around on him. Sometimes it's hard to uh, reacquire these guys visually, but the smoke trail really helps. And he's heading for Lassay, probably to try and go get a landing, which is smart. But, oh, he didn't make it. So he crashed into the ground. That smoke and fire are going to attract uh, unwanted attention. So we're going to turn southbound towards Bray Hall and look for friendly any, any aircraft fire if we need it. And then we're going to return to base. Now, I'm going to start pulling the power back here pretty soon. We're still at 1.2 or so, or maximum continuous. At 1.05, we will burn a lot less fuel and we will get a lot more distance for the amount of fuel burn. In other words, better miles per gallon or kilometers per liter, or whatever you do, at 105, at 1.05 than 1.02. And the difference is huge. Uh, you get 50% more distance out of your fuel at 1.05 as compared to 1.2. So once we know we're safe, we're going to pull it back. To that more economical power setting. Here's that very distinctive um, circular bay that's easy to find on the map and of course I know where that is relative to Bray Hall. We're just north of Bray Hall so we're gonna keep our speed up. Our plane is still good, haven't really taken any any punishment other than what we got from anti-aircraft fire at the Allied headquarters. I hit fast forward, so we're just about back at Goulet. I used pilotage and dead reckoning to get here. It was uneventful. I saw some planes off in the distance, but they were just specs. I don't know if they're a friend or foe. Didn't have the fuel to investigate. We are running on fumes here. I think the mission was successful, though. We hit a target deep in enemy territory, about as deep as a Anton can go when carrying a bomb. We hit the Allied headquarters, destroyed a couple targets there, fought a P-47, prevailed, and we're returning to the base from which we took off with a mostly intact airplane. Yes, we have some light damage, but it's not too bad. I think that the World War II era in DCS is underappreciated. I fly the jets too, but when you're doing that, especially the, the newer jets, at least I tend to feel like I'm fighting a pixel, not an airplane, you know, because the ranges involved in these missile shots are so great that if you see the enemy at all, it's a pixel on your screen. The World War II stuff is much more up close and personal and I think more effectively showcases DCS's flight models, graphics, and uh, the integration of the aircraft systems into the simulator. It's really well done in those regards and you'll feel that the first time, you don't even have to fly the airplane, the first time you get into the Anton when it's a cold dark airplane and you close the canopy and you power the thing up and you coordinate with ground control, you get the engine started, you bring all the systems online, you arm the weapons, uh, and the plane just comes alive, you'll have a real sense of accomplishment and you'll have a real understanding of what the pilots in these things did and what all of the, how all the aircraft systems work. And every time you look at a photo of an Anton or see one in a museum, you'll have that feeling that you really understand that airplane. I think DCS is really great in that regard. Now, I messed up here. I overshot final. I was going too fast, so I had to use a slip to bleed off that speed. And I'll get it on the runway here just fine, but really what I should have done probably is go around and come back around for another approach and landing. However, I'm so low on fuel, I didn't want to didn't want to risk that. I've got the stick all the way back so the tail wheel's locked, otherwise the thing will get really squirrely. I want to get the cowl flaps all the way open. And you want to be really careful with the brakes in this or the Dora. I don't know if Kurt Tank sourced brakes off of a heavy twin-engine fighter or what. Maybe it's just a DCS thing, but it doesn't take much more than a light tap on the brakes to tip this thing over on its nose. I'm going to taxi it into the hangar. Real life, I'd never do that. Um, I know people who've been fired for that It's from their airline jobs. It's considered very bad practice but I need the plane to be in the hangar because I plan to have it 
rearmed, refueled, and repaired. And if it's sitting out in the open, it'll be strafed before all of those things get done. And there's no option to park outside and have it towed in in DCS that I know of. Next, we're going to shut down the engine. We're going to be doing that by pulling the throttle all the way back past the idle stop to the fuel cutoff. You shut engines down in aircraft by shutting off the fuel, not the ignition. Very different from a typical car. We'll take a look at the external view and I want to talk about just a couple more things. So not only do I think that this is a great beginner airplane because you can recover from mistakes, mistakes on takeoff and landing, and because it's great for hunting down bombers, it's got a lot of firepower, a lot of ammunition, it can take some punishment, still get you home. It can also dogfight. It's not great. If you run into a, for example, an A-20 or a Mosquito, those planes will try and turn a bit and stay out of your sights. And the Mosquito is surprisingly maneuverable, so don't underestimate that one. But you can defeat them in the Anton. Now, don't let the Mosquito take shots at you either. It has four 20mm cannons that are even better than the Anton's excellent cannons. So the Mosquito is a real threat. But in any case, Mosquito, A-20, B-17, whatever, you can hunt down bombers very effectively with this. What you don't want to do is 1v1 against enemy fighters. Now, if you see an enemy fighter, especially a Spitfire, a Spitfire is special in this case because you can get away from it, don't hesitate to go in and take a shot at it. Just don't stick around to, to uh, get into a turn and burn sort of situation. Just take your shot and leave. He goes down or he doesn't, and maybe you can come back in. The best, come back in later, the best thing to do with Spitfires is kind of ignore them and let them watch in frustration as you shoot down their friendly bombers and there's nothing they can do about it because they just can't catch you in most situations. P-51 to P-47, that's another thing. They can catch you and really all you can do against those is get them into a horizontal scissors situation. Maybe you'll prevail. Best thing to do if those planes are in the area is stay near friendly anti-aircraft fire or fly in a group, or if you're on comms, have people come and help you. You can certainly give the 47 or a 51 a pretty good fight. It's just going to be hard to prevail against those airplanes if they're well flown by a human opponent. Now, if uh, the people that make the Anton module give us that 1.58 and 1.65 up at higher altitude uh, ATA, that higher power setting, that will make the Anton closer to equal to the 47 and 51 in a dogfight. Still won't be quite there, but it'll be a lot better than it is now, so I hope that they do that. Uh, again, I just can't stress enough. I think the DCS World War II arena is underappreciated, and I think that this module, the Anton, is underappreciated. And if you get the Anton, just trust me, just get Reflected's Harito campaign. You'll thank me later. Let's uh, take a look at some bomber attacks since I wasn't able to work it into this mission and then we'll wrap this up. Okay, we're back in single player. We're going up against B-17s. I'm going to try and take them out in the head-on pass. All my weapon systems are armed. Planes ready to go. You don't want to forget to arm your weapons uh, and then need to fire because the closure rate is so fast you won't have time to correct for that. Once I get the plane in sight, I'll aim just a little bit in front of it because I'm never quite exactly in front of it. And I'll open up with everything we've got, and he's on fire. He's probably going down. I'll talk about B-17 fires in just a minute. We're going to try and get lined up on the next one, but as you can see, there's not a lot of time, and the plane is sluggish on the controls at this altitude. This is harder to do than it looks. I'll get lined up on another here. And good hits, I believe one of his engines caught on fire, I couldn't quite tell. And we'll line up on what I think is the last one. And he starts to turn, probably because he's programmed to turn at this point in his flight profile, not because he's doing evasive action. I'll go in for a stern attack. That is pretty risky. I'll usually still shoot the B-17 down, but I'll usually take damage doing it. It would be more prudent to circle back around for a head-on attack, or gain altitude and come at him from above. In any case, this is what we're doing. I want to get close enough so that he's filling the ring sight, and then I'll open up with everything we've got. Sometimes I'll fire a short burst just to see where they go. I am using tracers here. I wouldn't do that if I was going up against fighters. All right, so 
we're on target, we're doing a lot of damage, he's on fire. I took some hits too, but uh, it's not too bad. Now once a B-17 is on fire, he is almost certainly going down. The first thing it tells the pilot to do in the procedure in the event of an engine fire in that airplane, we're talking about the B-17 pilot manual, it tells him to tell the crew to prepare to bail out, and that's because they know that the firefighting equipment to fight an engine or wing fire in a B-17 is really not too good. So it's unlikely that that fire is going to go out. We've probably shot down two, maybe three B-17s. Okay, new airplane, new day. We're doing a diving attack on a B-17. You can see he's just a speck in the distance, but we are moving really fast. I have to be very gentle with the controls to not break anything here. And opening up, and we got some good hits. Unfortunately, not good enough. He's not smoking. I, the reason you can't see him right now is I, I play DCS on a very wide screen monitor, and it records in sort of a standard format. I need to do something about that. Uh, in any case, we'll circle back around and get him in sight. Unfortunately, he's not on fire, which also makes him a little harder to reacquire. Also, if he was on fire, I probably wouldn't have to worry about closing in and taking more shots for the reasons I talked about earlier. But in any case, uh, he's certainly damaged, and we should be able to come back in and finish him off. You can see him just above the ring sight right now, and we're going to gain on him very rapidly, especially down at this altitude. Up at very high altitudes, it seems like you can get in some really long stern chases. And whoa, there's another B-17. We're going to change our plan and go for that one because it's a little bit safer. The top turrets on B-17s are very effective. They do have good sights and, generally speaking, very experienced gunners in the upper turret. Those were the higher ranking enlisted, per enlisted personnel on B-17s. But uh, I'd rather do this than a stern attack. So get lined up above and behind him, probably too high for the tail gunner to get us. Radio compartment and top turret are threats, but they don't seem to be firing. And we'll open up with everything. He's got four fires burning. That is, well, maybe three fires. In any case, he is definitely going down. So that's all I've got for now. I really appreciate you guys watching, and I really hope you give World War II DCS a chance. Thank you, goodbye, and have a great day.